but I know they were brought up again by this committee, and um, the committee had asked uh, Bill to come in and give us a bit of background about Point and Lane and the history of Point and Lane, etc. So, um, Bill, um, you call me this unit, Patrick Clark, and I'm going to say Cam, and Michelle Gibbard, the Dean of Age, and Demon. And Lord Perkins. And so, the floor is yours. Madam Chair, I'm a distinguished guest. I thought a, um, it was not placed very well, but uh, I have one circulating, which is the, the, uh, the plaque, okay, the, uh, the very old plaque. I'll tell you a little bit about it, and we'll go from there. 150 years after Sir John Johnson landed at Point Green with a survey party, planning on laying out a settlement for Cornwall, the federal government of the day, that was 1934, placed this, or this is a copy, the original plaque, on the south wall of the old post office at Pitt and Second. Many of you know that that post office was torn down approximately 1955 for the new federal building. And that plaque was taken down and moved to the federal building, okay, Sydney and Sydney. Sydney and second, I'll get that right, okay. It remained there for a number of years. In fact, as it was 21 years, if I've got the dates correct, till approximately 1955, when the old post office, well, I'm on the wrong page here, and I have to copy it this way, I'm going to have a short memory. You'll have to bear with me. It came uh, in June 85, there was a, a four day convention of the United States Empire Loyalists, and they put it on display in the lighted alcove at the library, because things had changed from the post office then to the library. It was again taken down and put in storage. The SDNG Historical Society requested Parks Canada to grant that the Cornwall Community Museum be named as the curator of that historic plaque. And Parks Canada, on August the 20th, 81, agreed, yet it was never moved. The plaque remained in the basement. It has now been recovered and it is now at our Woodhouse Museum, where I'm sure will be put on public display for everyone to see, and it will act as a guide for the younger generation and others to give us a small under understanding, at least a, a better understanding of the small part of our important early history. This um, plaque was put up honoring United Empire Loyalists, but it did more than that. It not only honors these people, but it reveals points of history that, uh, historical fact that we should all be aware of. For instance, the province of Quebec is mentioned on this document, not Ontario. As it was only in 1791 that two British colonies were created in Canada, namely Upper and Lower Canada, which was brought into force by the Constitutional Act of 1791 at the desire and insistence of the United Empire Loyalists. Many years later, on July the 1st, 1867, the province of Ontario came to be so named. It really named after Lake Ontario, as I can see it in history. Because the Indians called Lake Ontario that in the 1600s. The dates in the plaque are very clear, 1775 to 83, which are the dates of the American Revolution. Mentioned on the plaque is the King, amongst others, is the King's Royal Regiment of New York, the Royal Yorkers. They were the largest Loyalist Corps in the Northern Department during the Revolutionary War. They were formed by Sir, Lieutenant Colonel Sir John Johnson 
In June of 76, the first battalion was formed with 10 companies. In 1780, the second battalion was formed. Sir John Johnson was promoted to Brigadier General in 1782, and only about 19,000 loyalists were armed by the British and fought in the conflict. The American Revolution was not really a revolution, but rather a civil war. It split families and friends apart. John Adams, the signer of the Declaration of Independence, I'll get that right, Independence, said, one third of the people are loyalists, one third are patriots, and one third don't give a damn. Kind of an interesting statement from a guy who was trying to you know, form a new nation, but that's what he said. Fighting on the battlefield ended when British <coughs> General Cornwallis capitulated at the Battle of Yorktown in 1781. These loyalists that we honor here in Canada committed no crime, yet were treated far worse than criminals. To understand to some degree what these persons loyal to the British Crown want, went through at the hands of these so-called patriots, many of whom were nothing but rabble. Before and after the Treaty of Paris was signed in 1783, a terrible era of barbarianism took place. Public humiliation, and much worse, including torture, was the order of the day by these rebel groups calling themselves Sons of Liberty. No doubt some of these loyalists called them Sons of something very different. You can mm -hmm. well imagine what they might have called them. I'll leave that up to your own imagination. These rebel groups acted against all principles of war. They tar tarred and feathered, women and men alike. Now, for your information, I don't know what tar and feather is about. It's hot tar poured on, on, a, on a body, unclothed, and you can imagine the torture that would be by itself. But that's what they did. They stole their personal property. They burned their homes, farm buildings, and their crops. They shot and killed some loyalists and hung others and the government confiscated their property. The, Amer the American government, by the terms of the peace agreement signed in 1783, pledged itself to the fair treatment of these loyalists and the restitution of all confiscated property. Yet the individual states ignored those terms, and in many states, these loyalists became non-persons, unable to sell or buy land, work or speak or write their opinions, collect debts by legal means, or to seek the law's protection against, against physical attack. <coughs> this resulted in a great migration. A hundred thousand persons were hounded out of the 13 colonies. 35,000 settled in Nova Scotia, which included New Brunswick at that time. 50,000 ended up in, in Quebec. 5,000 went to Florida. It was owned by Spain. Many others returned to England. Records indicate that Sir John Johnson was responsible for the settling of 3,776 persons in the summer and early fall of 1784 along the north shore of the St. Lawrence River and the north shore of Lake Ontario, with many others to follow. The calamity of the Revolution and the cruelty of the war had driven into Canada the kind of people needed for its development. These loyalists had the skills, the energy, the determination required. It should be understood that without the armed intervention of France and Spain, the independence of the United States could not have been achieved. It should also be understood in that era there were no roads travel was, was by water. That was the main highway. I'm going to give you next uh, 
breakdown on Sir John Johnson, Sir William Johnson, Sir John Johnson, and a Carmelite. Okay. Sir, Sir William Johnson, he, he was the, he arrived from Ireland in 1738. He oversaw his uncle Peter Warren, land holdings on the Mohawk River. A lot of this history really rolls back to the Mohawk Valley. They were kicked out of the Mohawk, that is the northern group. Okay. This uncle uh, of his, this Peter Warren, later became a, a British admiral. Johnson bought land along the Mohawk River and began trading with the Indians. He learned the Mohawk language and adopted the Indian ways and customs. William Johnson succeeded beyond all other men in winning the confidence and affection of the Mohawk Indians. This he accomplished by fair dealing and trade with the Indians. By 1743, he became prosperous, and it was mostly the fur trade that made his fortune. Everybody in Europe was into, into furs at that time. The ladies wanted the fur hats and, uh, and the fur coats, and uh, Ontario West had, had an abundance of furs, and you had basically two, uh, the Indians were collecting the furs, and that's where the money was made. Uh, Sir, Sir William won the Battle of Lake George in 1755, defeating the French, and was, re and was promoted to a major general. <coughs> in 1759, at Fort Niagara, he was second in command of that to a General John Prideau, he was who was killed at that battle, and Johnson took over command and captured the fort. His son, Sir John, was with him at both these battles. At one battle he was 14, and the other when he was 19. So he started into warrior status very young. In 1760 he served under General Amherst in the capture of Montreal. He founded Johnstown, New York, and named it after his son, Sir John. He became a, uh, a baron, and he was therefore always called Sir William thereafter. He was appointed superintendent of all Indian affairs of the Six Nations, and other northern Indians remained so until his death. He built Fort Johnson near Amsterdam, New York, and he built Johnson Hall, both of which remain today. I've been at both places. Johnson Hall is a, a very old building, very, very beautiful. You wonder how a building could be kept in such a nice shape over all these years. And beside it is a stone building uh, where the, the uh, Negro slaves resided. I should have brought a picture of it, but I forgot. He lived with Molly or Mary Grant, and they had eight children with her. Uh, I know what you're going to maybe ask if you're interested. Molly Grant was an Indian, and he had, yes, he had these children with her, but he called it her his housekeeper. In his will, there's no reference to him being married to her, but yet it was like a common law uh, relationship. And Molly Brandt's younger brother, Joseph, came to live with them, and uh, Sir William sent him to school as an Indian, and later served with him, this, this uh, man, Joseph, served with him on military expeditions. He became later Captain Joseph Brandt. And Sir William was recognized by the American government in his later years. They hated his guts, if you want to know the truth about it. But in his later years, he was, he was uh, they granted that he was the most important man, man of his time in the, in the Americans. In the, okay. Sir John, his son, that's the guy who landed here at Point Moline. I had mentioned earlier about Sir John landing at Point Moline with the surveyors. Now for the rest of that story. Upon landing at Point Moline, Point Moline, he was met by Indian chiefs and warriors from St. Regis, who said they thought it would be unjust to take away from them the land that had always looked, they had always looked upon as theirs. They claimed deeds were burned in the fire at their church at St. Regis. They also said that Sir John's father, Sir William, had promised to have the land conferred to them. 
Sir John, fluent in the Mohawk language himself, discussed with them if they were willing to re relinquish their claim, and they replied, it was a matter of weight, and merited serious consideration at an assembly of the whole of their people. Excuse me. Sir John had to return. The, the survey party could not continue because of this episode, but he had them going farther west and doing um, surveys where it wouldn't be uh, a problem for these Indians until it was settled. He had to, he, Sir John had to return to Montreal to check with government Haldeman. An agreement was reached between them and Captain Joseph Brandt was sent to St. Regis to confer with the council. Brandt, Captain Brandt, reported back to Sir John the deal was struck and Brandt told the Indians that they would still have three miles of riverfront, Gray's Creek East and North going to the Ottawa River. That house she built for my, uh, my stepdaughter, it was really on Indian land. That's what they call a subdivision, Indian land. <laughs> I hope it's all cleared up right now. I think it is. But at any rate, that's, that's history. Um, and I, I did say that, that that went north, so, so the Indians over here at St. Regis would be able to get to the Ottawa River. And when he, when he came back and notified Sir John that uh, gave an opening for the surveyors to lay out the town plot one mile square here in Cornwall, which wasn't Cornwall at the time, by the way. I believe it was called Johnstown. Uh, New Johnstown. Or New Johnstown, yeah. So John John, he was born at Amsterdam, New York, which is very close to Albany. At his father's death in 1774, Sir John inherited his father's title and extensive lands making him a wealthy landowner, approximately 200,000 acres. What a pile of property. He married Mary Watts in 73, and get this, he had 10 sons and four daughters. That's before television. When the American Revolution um, broke out in 75, it was made very clear that he wouldn't support the rebels. An army of 3,000 Continental troops disarmed him and his followers. In May 76, hearing that he was to be arrested, he fled with 170 of his tenants and allies among the Iroquois Confederacy to St. Regis. That trip on old Indian trails through the Adirondacks was very difficult, and they were on the point of starvation, but they survived. He got to Montreal and formed the Royal Yorkers. <clears throat> Royal. God, excuse me for a second. <clears throat> and formed the Royal Yorkers, which I previously spoke of, and which is here. That trip apparently took 19 days, but I can't, I can't knock it down to early whether it was from Johnstown to, to St. Regis it was 19 days, or it was Johnstown to St. Regis to Montreal was 19 days. But yet, he had a, a bit of a rest at St. Regis. He had to, they were, they were, there wasn't hardly anything left of them. His wife and children, when he fled, were left behind, and she was detained and somehow got through the rebel lines and got to New York and met up with her husband, Sir John. The, British still, still had control of New York City and the area. It was very difficult for her and very hard on a young baby that she had had. There is a, this, another dispute here that you just cannot get because you can get it two different ways. As to whether that baby died, there's some talk of it being dead when Sir John saw the baby when they crossed the river into New York territory. But yet, he, they had a baby that died a year and a half later at Montreal. Now, whether it was the same baby, we don't know. And history doesn't tell us that. Sir John's history, Sir John Johnson's history is quite extensive. 
He certainly accumulated many hundreds of, of acres of farm land, both in Ontario and Quebec. He built Williamstown. Williamstown was named by him. And remained, uh, there is a historic site, that house that he built. He built a sawmill and a, and a, and a gristmill basically on the same terms as, or the same idea that his father had built in his estate beside Johnstown in New York. He donated 12 acres of land to the Williamstown Fairgrounds. And by God, that, that, uh, that fair is still going strong after 200 years. His principal residence was Montreal. He was appointed, appointed in command of the British Indian Department until his death. During the War of 1812, he died in 1830, but during the War of 1812 he was appointed Colonel-in-Chief of six township battalions of the Quebec Militia. To show you what esteem he was held in, 300 Mo Mohawks attended his funeral in 1930. Burial occurred at Mount Johnson near Chamblay. Black Sir John and a small lake near the sheep was named after him. I'm going to a local now. I'm Captain Samuel Anderson. He was born in the U.S., trained in law at Boston. Military, it all connects somehow here. He served with Sir, Sir William Johnson and later with his son, Sir John Johnson. He served at Crown Point in Ticonderoga on Lake Champlain. He commanded 30 men in the taking of Montreal from the French. After the Seven Year War, he settled in Pownell, Vermont, with his wife and his brothers. They had 440 acres of land, mostly cleared, houses, three of them, horses, oxen, cows, and ten cattle, later all confiscated by the rebels. Anderson was offered a commission in the rebel forces and refused. Then he was seen as a king's man, a loyalist. He was imprisoned. He escaped. He was enlisting other men to the British side and was caught again in Connecticut, charged with enlisting men to the British cause. Near the end of 76, jailed again, escaped later, headed to Bennington, Vermont, and joined with General Burgon's army. He later joined up with Sir John Johnson. His wife was 36 years old in 78, and I had to acquire a pass for two shillings sixpence for herself and her six children to leave. She finally got to Sorel, where her husband was stationed. In 79, Captain Anderson and his brothers were on the top of the banished forever list from the state of, New of Vermont. If caught, they'd be arrested, whipped on the naked back no less than 20 or more than 40 times, and ordered out. If caught again, they'd be put to death. And that is in the record. During the American Revolution, he commanded the Light Company of the King's Royal Regiment of New York under Sir John Johnson's command. His land grant, Lot 1 and 2 and the first, second, and third concessions, there's a plaque in his honor at Glenstone Lodge. Direct descendants of his remained on that property. Mary Van Reswick, I believe, was the last one. Uh, last one alive, um, and I think she died in early 2012 when she passed on. Captain Anderson had it was just at the beast in '84, Commissioner Lowe's, District of Montreal, head over all the King's stores here in Johnstown, handing out British um, supplies that were sent to them, plowshares, etc. In the, later, in, in '91, he remained as Chief Magistrate. He became a judge of the Surrogate Court, and finally he became postmaster of Cornwall. Captain Anderson's sons, who had escaped Vermont with his wife, also served in the war, one being a lieutenant, and one being a land grant just west of the town. In 1784, when the, when the Loyalists arrived here, it was primeval forest, untamed, gloomy, wild, stretching back from the banks of the St. Lawrence River. After what these loyalists went through upon landing at Point Moline, just being there was a point of hope for them. French explorers referred to it as Point Alamade, the cursed point. 
You'll have to excuse my French because I don't speak it too well, so my pronunciation could be a little bit off. Crown forces camped overnight en route to Montreal, Sir Geoffrey Amherst called it Pointe de Maline. Throughout the 70s, Maline Grand Point, Petit Point, Johnson's Point, and Potash Point were names it was referred to as. Pointe Maline is entwined in our history, long before 1784 and after with the French and with the Loyalists, from Quebec to Upper Canada and eventually to the province of Ontario. And without these events happening, we might very well be part of the United States. God forbid. Upon their arrival, these loyalists had to clear the land. They had far too many trees, and their first saleable product was potash. After burning the trees, they had to pearl white ash, and they had a market for it. They could trade it for credit with a Cornwall firm called Wilkinson and Bikey, yes, pronunciation could be wrong. But they had a choice. They could sell it to a potash factory set up on Point Moline. Crude buildings were set up on Point Moline with the large tubs, iron kettles, and with water they boiled the mixture from which lye was extracted. This continued well into the 19th century. I believe this was the first industry created here. Michael Van... I got him. Vandernet and perhaps other business people understood the profits to be made by turning potash into lye. It was used as a disinfectant or for making soap. And perhaps those other people that uh, were partners of his, it doesn't, it's kind of uh, loosey goosey on that, that issue. Sir John Johnson's decision to haggle over the ownership of Point Moline has proven correct. Looking back at history, it was imperative that ownership of Point Moline be acquired. Otherwise, the government could have been a problem of building a canal through it and the industry that followed here in Cornwall. Dr. Darby Bergen, the Irish Roman Catholic, should be recognized as the most important man in Cornwall's, mil in Cornwall's history. His military career alone he was first raised the first volunteer rifle company of Cornwall. Target shooting was a sport at that time. The goal, of course, was Bisley in England. He was a surgeon of the regiment, <coughs> captain and major. In 1868, the 59th Stormont and Hungary Battalion of Inf Infantry was formed, with Colonel Bergen, Bergen as commanding officer. He remained in that position for the next 17 years a record never to be surpassed. He was named the first Surgeon General of Canada. And in that position, he organized the medical forces that were sent out to subdue Louis Riel in the Northwest Rebellion. His political life. He was first a, an MP of Cornell Township, 1872 to five, and from 1878 to 1882. MP for Stormont, 1882, until <coughs> his death in 1896. He was first elected as a liberal and he was defeated, then returned as a conservative and he never looked back. Did I tell you something, Glenn? <laughs> <laughs> Bergen made important contributions in the area of labor and industrial <coughs> health. He had private members bill prohibiting children under 12 from being employed. He also championed bills for safety and cleanliness. Most fell by the wayside, but eventually many of his suggestions were used in provincial legislation under the Ontario Factories Act of 1884. Going back to 1847, the typhoid, fe typhoid fever the epidemic broke out here, and a temporary <coughs> hospital was set up at Point Moline, south of the first canal. To give you an idea of the size of it, six buildings were set up. Three were 36 by 18, one 60 by 18, one 12 by 18, and the last was 12 by 12 
for those that had died. In charge was Dr. Darby Bergen, along with a Dr. McDonald or McDonnell. Assisting, they had two doc assisting these two doctors, they had two male attendants and two female nurses. Hospital opened on <coughs> June the 14th to October the 18th. 234 patients were treated, 182 discharged, and 52 died. Sometime later, Dr. Bergen attended to a smallpox ep epidemic at St. St. Regis Abbasatni. He was a top ma man in the horse racing field. Dr. Bergen and his lawyer, brother, John, operated the Stormont Stock Farm. They either fully owned Bellevue Farm, which was, which was renowned across the country for stud horses, or shared ownership with a, a veterinary surgeon by the name of W.H. Craig. And that's unclear. In 85, the racetrack was in the very heart of town. The track was south on Sydney Street. Now it's going the opposite way. South on Sydney Street, east on 2nd to Adolphus, and north approximately one mile. My, my, that must have been a sight to see. The freeholder in 1878 stated, Cornwall has more trotting horses per square mile than any town in Canada. Dr. Bergen was recognized by the naming of Bergen Lake after him. Bergen Lake was in front of Mill Rush, now underwater, and a town, and a, a, a street in the city, Bergen Avenue. Dr. Bergen's funeral was at St. Columbus Church, attended by thousands, paying res respect to this great man. His burial was at Flanagan's Point, for those that, that doesn't ring a bell with. Flanagan's Point is the churchyard beside the Roman Catholic Church, West of Glen Walter. There's a very beautiful, tall monument there, and in the last couple of years it's been redone. It is worth, you can't see it from the road, <coughs> because of the tree structure. But if you drive in and take a look at it, it's, uh, it's a sight to see. I would so strongly suggest that uh, something should be done further in respect to this great man. As I see it, one short street, one short street in Cornwall is, is not quite enough to honor this great man's contribution to this area. Due to time restraints, and I, I'm probably <laughs> boring you right to the difference, but I have briefly touched on two very important persons, Molly Brandt, Sir John Johnson's housekeeper, and her brother, Captain Joseph Brandt, Indian Chief of Chiefs of the Six Nations, very, very important people in Canada's history. But we won't go into that, because my time is just about up. I think I'm going to get thrown on here. Point Moline has by its high elevation a line of sight unequal to any other spot along Cornwall's waterfront. With all due respect, I believe this waterfront committee should get this project again going forward, but not necessarily <coughs> to be planned as you might envision it to be. Thank you for your patience in hearing me out. 